in uh, last week, uh, pagers as well as walkie-talkies uh, of Hezbollah operatives started to kind of explode. Uh, there were actually ca- reported casualties in terms of hundreds and uh, whatever is about uh, as per my sources and my discussions there are pretty much a lot in fact the Iranian envoy in Lebanon and Beirut also kind of uh, is acknowledged uh, to suffer uh, injuries on his face this operation is a benchmark in cyber attacks uh, this also reveals a capability uh, this reveals a uh, a mission mode weaponization of the cyber mode, uh, specifically weaponizing supply chains. Hi, everyone. You know, when we decided to discuss the current war in Israel, uh, you know, especially what's changing with it, uh, we were faced with a very interesting question. Uh, who do we bring in to talk about the changing face of war, uh, the new things that are happening? Should we bring in a veteran who's been in the battlefield? Should we bring bring in a, an expert, a techie, a technical guy who knows how modern warfare is going? Or should we bring in somebody from the industry uh, who is involved in uh, developing uh, new age uh, technologies? Uh, thankfully, we got Samir Joshi. And let me introduce Samir to you. He is a veteran, an Air Force, an ex Air Force pilot. He's also an innovator. He's worked on the space program. He's worked on defense industry, and now he's doing a very exciting uh, a new project. He's heading uh, new space technologies, which are working on cutting edge uh, drone systems, automated systems, uh, integrating a lot of AI and technology into it. Uh, to s- start straight away, I would like to ask uh, Samir. So, I mean, we've seen, you know, recently uh, very exciting things. So some might call it a very, uh, uh, you know, alarming things in the in the Israel uh, Hezbollah crisis. We've seen infiltration of supply chains. We've seen technology being used to carry out specific uh, targeted killings or attacks. Uh, in your opinion, uh, has warfare been? totally disrupted. Uh, are we seeing a new phase in which, you know, you're using very pinpointed information, intelligence, and technology to carry out warfare away from the traditional, uh, conventional war that we know of? Yeah, Manu, first is uh, you painted a very larger-than-life picture of me. I'll get down to Mother Earth to answer this because this is a very big problem now everybody has on this planet. So, uh, uh, as you rightly said, you know, Warfare is interest uh, is entering a new, very interesting phase. I think uh, when we, we when we talk of uh, warfare, we can largely divide it into kinetic and non-kinetic actions. You know, uh, the way it started, and 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 history has started to record modern warfare from World War One onwards. Largely, you know, there was introduction of the tank, which kind of created a lot of dynamics. Then maneuver warfare settled down from trench warfare, it settled on more towards maneuver warfare. This this, this expanded with the coming of aeroplane. And World War II, you could create those air-launched effects. You know, the 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 bombing uh, campaign of the American and the RAF uh, uh, Air Force has kind of tilted everything in favor of, uh, you know, the Allies. And post that, you know, jet engine, a lot of other things, stealth and other things, you know. This this kind of keep going on and on. Uh, but I think uh, there was a huge uh, kind of, you know, change. Sometimes this transition happens sometime in the 2000s. Three different aspects kind of uh, hit uh, the evolutionary phase where uh, military experts kind of deemed that there is a transition happening in the last 10 years. The first phase was, of course, uh, you know, the uh, the introduction of robotic platforms, uh, you know, uh, which can take certain level of uh, mission needs and, you know, convert them into tangible action. The second was the introduction of autonomy and artificial intelligence, you know the first shades of the same, which actually settled down uh, with the second wave uh, in the end 90s, but transitioned on to the 2000s. So uh, commercial off-the-shelf available uh, autonomy kind of uh, empowered these robotic agents to create a lot of uh, concept of employments, which were applicable to a certain mission need. This was also visible as we go forward. But then, you know, there is an interesting facet, which was of a cyber capability which started to show itself. When you combine all these things, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, autonomy, and cyber, you kind of create a product which uh, can do 
something in an uncrewed manner remotely or through a layer of so let's say the medium of an internet or a communication voice or any social media platform you can weaponize this full stack this full chain is weaponized now uh 2006 if you remember the cia and uh, you know the israeli mossad they kind of introduced uh, a small uh, bot stugnet that's what it was called and 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 it kind of you know increased the speed of the centrifuges to that level where they kind of uh, led to a meltdown this was the first known major intervention through the cyber medium okay so uh what what eventually happened is uh the the this kind of created a big problem for everybody they created then certain security protocols you could have you could have air gap computers you could have compartmentalized kind of you know uh, uh aspects which go on now and which increasingly if you realize uh, everything is pretty much hard and you know everything in terms of security uh applications as well as installations is hardened and a lot of effort is being put on the security uh, aspects but uh, you know in spite of this there were pagers and walkie talkies exploding in lebanon now this makes a very interesting statement as you rightly pointed out weaponizing the supply chain and yes, uh, so samir i wanted to ask you on that you know well, so, so people have been have been have seen this i'm sure this was underway a lot of people are trying to gain this capability but weaponization of a supply chain has a very far reaching consequence just beyond on pagers and uh, you know uh, uh, or mobile phones uh, because the, the supply chain today in today's world is so globalized you know you don't know which part is coming from where so what are the risks that you see here even for conventional war fighting platforms so if you recall uh in last week uh, pagers as well as walkie talkies uh, of hezbollah operatives started to kind of explode uh there were actually ca- reported casualties in terms of hundreds and uh, whatever is about uh, as per my sources and my discussions there are pretty much a lot in fact the iranian envoy in lebanon and brut also kind of uh, is acknowledged uh, to suffer uh, injuries on his face this operation is a benchmark in cyber attacks uh this also reveals a capability uh this reveals a a mission mode weaponization of the cyber mode uh specifically weaponizing the supply chains so what happened was there was uh, there was a company from taiwan which uh, makes these pagers and uh, there is another company in hungary called bsc which uh, uh which uh, got this license from golden apollo the maker of the taiwani uh, pagers and kind of started to produce uh, these pagers now nobody knows where bsc in hungary you know who's behind bsc in hungary and, and it's an acknowledged fact it was a mossad front so a supply chain where the pager is imported from a taiwanese company goes to hungary and it ends up in hezbollah uh, uh, operations you know it didn't happen overnight this would have taken years for mossad to kind of infiltrate get the confidence of all operatives from hezbollah and we naturally know why hezbollah has shifted to pagers the israelis are able to triangulate their mobiles and next days they receive a small diameter bomb through the window and uh, this is the story so they got down to low tech pagers they kind of uh, it takes a while before you are able to triangulate the position of a pager because it goes through the medium partially through internet and otherwise uh but the israelis were on top of it uh what we can see and we can clearly say since 2006 the last the second campaign in lebanon israel has been upping the ant in terms of preparing to take on hezbollah because it considers and because of which it left hamas in the bay and kind of ignored some kind of things it considers hezbollah as its number one enemy hezbollah is the tip of the sword for attacks by iran on israel this is a known fact is iranians are supporting it full time there is a full presence now coming back to uh, how this happened is uh, we are seeing a transition from operations against hamas uh, in the gaza strip and israelis now have it under a bit of control yes there are small elements uh, while i'll keep the politics aside hostages are still there there is going to be a peace deal negotiated etc cetera, etc cetera. but largely the israelis have finished and are on top of the military op to contain hamas there is a small element there is still we know we don't know where senwar is hiding and where is ontaraj is but that's that's something which will continue what they have de- seen and you would have been noticing a lot of heavy weaponry has been moving to the north over the last couple of months israelis are ready to poise in fact when this pager incident happened i was thinking that this was totally to neutralize the command control chain 
so that there was total indecision uh, kind of uh, you know happening in the, the Hezbollah cadre and kind of launch an attack. But this does not happen. So uh, the attack was primarily to one uh, inflict maximum damage through a certain medium, so that there is chaos, there is disruption in the command chain. Second was to force these guys to kind of assemble at one place where, uh, as you see about three days back, they knocked down the primary members of the special command group, which has a bullah has. And uh, they had some very serious casualties. Going back now, what actually happened is, if Israel has activated this measure, this, they have, now they know that the world knows about it. It cannot happen again and again. So that means it was a very important decision by the Israelis to take this. And this decision is part of a very well thought of kind of measure, step by step approach, which you see it unfolding in the last three days. First, create chaos. Second, neutralize the top command chain. Third is, if you see in the last three days, the airstrikes are targeting all the weapon platforms in southern Lebanon, which the Hezbollah has. And, and uh, because they have intermixed that mostly with civilian assets, so, you know, there are some civilian casualties also happening. But it is surgically removing that threat of the long-range rockets. You would have seen uh, there is hardly any kind of rockets coming out of Lebanon. In fact, there was a report uh, that uh, they have also knocked down some uh, ex-Soviet Union rockets which were stored in uh, all these places. So, this plan is unfolding. The cat is back. This can be weaponized. And the supply chain, uh, I mean, this operation. But all I want to say is, Manu, uh, specifically to address this, this would have taken years if it has been exposed. You cannot do it again in the same way. So when we say the supply chain can be weaponized, it's not so easy. Okay. And it takes years of work. And and but at the same time, it widely brings out on the table uh the aspect that, you know, this is there now. Uh, America has been the Chinese uh, supply chain, India has been saying, okay, we let's get cut down on Chinese aspects, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So this is where the light problem. So, so, I mean, I wanted to, you know, uh, tell our viewers a bit more about the kind of vulnerabilities these have because, you know, when we talk tech, we, we, we assume a lot of people understand what it is, but sometimes it's not that easy. Uh, this supply chain, what they've shown is that you can insert a small bit of explosive in something which is very difficult to detect. Uh, and this is a pager, mind you. What if something like this technically, you know, you have a fighter jet in which you order a little you know, a little electronic part which has to be replaced and the Chinese or somebody infiltrates and it's flying at Mark II, uh, you know, a very expensive platform. Can that be brought down? Can this vulnerability also be used to bring down so many drones that India now has? Can this be used to take down an expensive war fighting platform like a warship, a submarine? Because you see electronics everywhere and what this operation has shown is very difficult to detect, you know, a three gram, five gram explosive but place at the right position in you know, on a war fighting platform that can be quite de uh, devastatingly deadly. Absolutely. Uh, first is uh, I want to make it clear that uh, it's not easy to do something like this. Uh, it's while a lot of people and uh, forums have gone ballistic over oh suddenly our own mobiles will explode, our cars will come to a uh, striking halt, and the aircraft will kind of nosedive and crash. This is not the way it works. I'll talk on the tech part first. Okay, then I'll talk on the supply chain. So largely, if you have to pull off something like this, there are three elements, right? The first element is the hardware itself. Any hardware, uh, you you kind of have to infiltrate, as you rightly said, three to five grams of explosives. There are many ways you can do a lot of things. Uh, we don't even know where it is. We do, it may be in the even in the battery chemistry for that matter. The battery is used because that is something which totally escape the scanners. You see, uh, the second aspect is the software. The software of the system itself, you know, the software which is interacting with the hardware to carry out a certain function, which is the major function of the of that device. And the third layer is the cyber layer, where it is interacting with the outer world through which, okay, it can be through 4G, 5G, it can be through internet, it can be through even direct connection to a computer and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Now look at all the steps. That means this could have been done by the, uh, because everybody is saying there's release, so I will play again. It is the Israelis, <laughs> but uh, it could have been done uh, anywhere as part of this chain. But the explosive has to be there, you see. So that is the first part. So if, let's say tomorrow, I have to do something like this against a fighter plane, as you rightly say, uh, I think it's still a far stress thought. I'll explain why. You see, 
everybody is aware of this danger and it's not something i mean of course it happened at a very low under the radar kind of level in the past there were freak instances you know people just were assassinated or terrorists were taken out uh, only the crude way was to blow up and use 10 kg with 10 kg of explosives the expert always used 10 grams of explosives so that's that's always been there but i think uh, there is a difference when you design a fighter plane when you are designing a fighter plane you are very much cognizant of these fact you are aware that the various layers from where the supply chain is operating and his subcontractors everything is kind of scrutinized he has to go as part of the bill of materials it has to be from a known source but the most important thing which is done when designing a fighter plane and i'll take you back to the f35 example is you source the supply chain through friendly countries through contacts which are verified and through contracts which in a parlance of let's say a crude kind of blockchain philosophy you can verify you will recall last year uh the f35 fleet was grounded because there were two components which were found by a contractor which had been uh, you know sourced from china correct yes till the time that thing was not resolved uh there was this i think 2 3 weeks the the whole fleet was down no no says the kind of serious nets everybody takes so i think when you talk of a fighter plane this is a very very well protected kind of thing similarly for other military grade equipment anything which has security implications i don't think it is just run of the mill and this is where the dichotomy is popping up in india why because the drones which everybody wants at a very fast scale there are a lot of interdependencies de- dependencies still on a country like china at this juncture there is no country which can make a complete drone by itself even the americans who are trying and you know they have got this blue uas concept where everything has to be non chinese etc etc but i am aware that they are still allowing imports of motors as well as propellers hmm. the components which don't have a electronic emission or some kind of thing from china it's simply because while we can take a day at our own industry and say okay you know we are a little slow but even the mighty american infrastructure the mighty american industry is also taking its time to get into the sub components of the of the drones and this is of a specific type i'm talking you know the the low cost the low hanging fruits we, we're not looking at very high end kind of things that is a well laid out infrastructure in the us so india now uh, there have been reports you know people have been just uh, shifting getting these chinese components so people have again gone a bit ballistic on the same i would like to point out that at this juncture in india we do not have the full supply chain you know which is kind of in set in motion so a lot of sourcing is done through china can the chinese weaponize that aspect a certain elements absolutely certain elements which need to be uh, validated verified these are like uh, the components which have an Ameri- uh, uh, some kind of emission electronically or can be activated electronically or can connect to the observed world uh, please go back to what i said hardware software and a cyber layer if any cyber layer is interacting with any part or component of a drone or any any kind of system any system it the vulnerability is kind of uh, being laid open because this generally is activated remotely this mm-hmm. is the thing which you is inside a job inside a job then it's open to the full scrutiny so you have to protect your supply chains you have to get it from friendly countries you have to get this you have to verify ratify the subcontractors so when we looking to indigenously and localize all these aspects i think the government is Uh, you know they they're focusing on the right uh, technologies the right uh, processes to get these there uh, but we will have to walk the tight line of availability to demand as well as the mission effectiveness what people seek until that time that is we don't have a indigenous full scale capability full stack capability i'll say we will be vulnerable to these aspects so we have to find a way where we can validate and verify any sub component which is fitted on a system against all these contingencies which you know hardware software and the cyber layer which make the whole system vulnerable so i think we we trying to move in that direction uh, you know there are there, there is there are government initiatives to do that it's not easy like you said you know because the supply chain is so diverse and their components are so many that sometimes some things can slip in through but just to tell our viewers we are in a very exciting phase of development in india you are at the very edge of it you know we are developing a lot of indigenous systems as you and your company have made swarm drones you've shown capability of integrating automation to uh, you know uh, to to for newer applications uh, can you tell us a bit more about that uh, where do you see the future of warfare you know uh, away from the hezbollah uh, uh, israel thing to the ukraine and russia war we've seen 
long drones, automated systems, take down super expensive platforms. Uh, how, how is India stacking up there? What is What are we looking for? And what kind of capabilities are you guys doing or which you see coming up in the next few uh, uh, years? That's a big question. See, warfare is at a cusp of a new doctrinal uh, evolution. You know, it is powered by various tenets and uh, of Industry 4.0, largely, as I said, you know. Uh, and when you when you link them to concept of operations, uh, uh, the unfolding AI boom uh, and the robotics revolution across all walks of life, it is transforming this into a very significant uh, and impactful vector of evolution. So, uh, because the AI systems because the robotic systems are increasingly having more autonomy and become truly robotic, the disruption portion is kind of, you know, leading us to the question, are we moving to a next generation leap, the gen change? So I will quickly say that if anybody wants to get into this field, we have to understand what is the previous gen and what is the new gen looking at? What are the facets of that? So what was the previous gen? Go back to Ukraine and you will understand. These The, the previous gen was fewer exquisite systems, expensive systems in fewer number. We can relate to a main battle tank. You know, it can do a lot of functions. It's a very exquisite system. It is an expensive platform or it is not available in 10,000, 20,000 numbers, you know, as we go forward. Uh, this is where if you knock off one, two, three of them, suddenly that void comes and the gap comes. So the legacy way of uh, if you, let's say you had five to ten fighter planes uh, coming to strike and you knock them all off, your own strike vector goes for a bunt. So um, this is what the previous gen was. It was kind of mixing a uh, lot of strategies, the airland concepts and maneuver warfare, etc. Et so what is changing? Uh, the, what is wrong with the previous gen? It is very brittle. Brittle approach to against a very capable adversary. And especially when we look at anti-axis area denial, A2, AD, you know, the layered. Uh, they're expensive. They, are, they become unaffordable after a certain time. And... Uh, you know, uh, attrition is unescapable. Uh, so there is also at times reluctance by the commanders to put them. Like the Ukrainians never went to that major offensive because of the initial losses they suffered in uh, in Zaporizhia. So this this is hence an unsecure way in 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 face of the new technologies which are coming. So I'll explain now what is the next gen. The next gen, uh, again, best part to us these days is just refer to Ukraine. The next gen is very large numbers of very smart things uh, either with a uh, man on the loop or on totally autonomy, you know, uh, mode. This brings back the principle of mass and warfare. So this mass and warfare started, if you go back to the history of warfare, uh, mass is what Chinggis Khan, you know, the Mongols kind of thrived at. They kind of created swarms, mass of these. This finally ended up in this strange warfare because you had a contact battlefield. But again, the mass, once the evolution of tanks came. So now the tanks are going to fly. You know, it's it's not kind of far available maneuver of that available, and and some people say you know the redundancy of uh, tanks. Uh, looking at if tanks are relevant anymore, etc. Uh, let's not get into that. That's a different thing. So, what is the desired attribute of the modern way of war? Uh, large numbers, uh, which are affordable, sustainable, in uh, terms of proliferation, smart, intelligent, adaptive, self-learning. You know, this is this is the next phase which we are we already seeing. This is already hitting us. Reduced human elements. The first contact will be with a robotic platform, period. You have to inflict maximum casualties to the other side, the adversary. Otherwise, he will do the same with you. Any country which does not upgrade this robotic arsenal in the years ahead will tend to have a big blooper as we go forward. You know. So, uh, how do you reduce the uh, you know the human component? You have man and man teaming, these kind of, as well as collaborative autonomy between robotic agents. This leads to the question of swarming which is largely, you know, decentralized in nature where autonomy and full stack is available as a pure psychophysical. And last is the use of mass. What do you use this for? Large number of agents, heterogeneous, they can be unmanned ground vehicles, they can be UAVs in a battlefield. And, and again, more applicable where uh, we are seeing the results. Saturation is achieved by the numbers. They kind of overwhelm the numbers of the other side. I'll give you an example. You know, over a period of time, the Russians have were a bit late as compared to the Ukrainians and, you know, getting onto this robotic set. So all their legacy platform, they used to attack, you know, three, four tanks coming together. The Ukrainians were creating a mass of uh, first-person uh, shooter drones to take them on. While we see these videos, these flashy videos on this thing, uh, uh, all uh, social media content, but I think what you see is one hit out of 20, 30 uses. But mm. the, 
Indians are using 10,000 drones a day. They can. They have that uh, kind of arsenal. That means four to five tanks can be addressed with about 100 drones. The Ukrainians have created that kind of capability where they have drone operators. They're getting kids, 17, 18, 19 year old kids, sitting two kilometers behind the main tactical line and taking on these things. So overwhelming by sheer numbers, enhanced effectiveness, uh, this can be through collaboration, through kind of uh, cooperation and emergent behavior. This is the future of warfare or command of the skies in 2030s. We have to get down to creating combat mass. This was a term which was uh, generated, you would have heard it. The US wants to call it affordable mass. They have a new program called the Replicator. Now, this Replicator program is largely creating, uh, you know, a lot of assets which are ground launched and air launched, which can work, uh, you know, right with the infantry soldier to going toward the loyal wingman kind of technologies, you know, uh, which is which is coming on. So the future of warfare is a lot of robotic agents working together to create a mass with the human teaming and being the first vector of contact with the adversary to generate those air launched effects which can be kinetic or non-kinetic in nature. So Samir, we're coming between you and your breakfast and your designing of these new systems. So my last question to you, where do you see India in this, uh, you know, in this new tech warfare? Are we at a good place and what is your suggestion on, you know, what needs to be improved or done? Yeah. So I think uh, uh, the government is definitely pushing a lot of facets of the same. But uh, Manu, what is important to note is that not all lessons coming out of Ukraine may be directly applicable to us. You know, we have to flesh it out. We have to filter out what is relevant. We have a different adversary. We have different terrains. We have a different format of warfare. You can't, I mean, you know how uh, difficult it is to change legacy thoughts in warfare. So the first step towards this is, you know, creation uh, of a man and unmanned teaming element with these robotic agents. Now, the, is the government cognizant of that? I think it's very much uh, cognizant. Uh, you can look at uh, the EPs, the Make Two programs, and the other R and D focus, which is uh, which is focusing on a lot of robotic layers. Uh, this is right from the Navy, right from the Air Force side, and right from the Army. Of course, the Army is the major beneficiary. You will uh, understand that they have inducted close to twenty five hundred drones in the last couple of years through various uh, mechanisms. The government. If you ask me, it is focused. It is also very focused on creating Atman Nirbhata. There are, you know, uh, uh, the DAP has come out in a very big, uh, DAP 2020 has come out in a very strong manner against uh, getting these make thresholds done, getting mechanisms like TDF, like IDEX, Innovation for Defense Excellence. The amendments even favor a lot of, uh, you know, companies uh, which are industry focused. If you recall, 25% of the R&D budget in uh, R&D facet of the military budget uh, of the defense budget is totally for industry players and the rest go to PSUs and DRDU. That is a big, big facet. My worry is only, will this convert on the ground? Uh, I think the government with all its might is pushing it. The, the the problem what we what we feel on the ground is that any program which comes, uh, it has to be mapped to a certain missionary. Okay, there is a technology progressive roadmap which the government lays down. It has to have a very good product definition. What the government wants, what the end user wants, and these are largely the armed forces. I'm seeing some disconnect in very hastily kind of putting certain programs there, which. Because the engineering aspects are not very clearly defined and mapped to a certain mission need, will put a lot of pressure on the industry, which kind of works towards uh, design and development or research or development of the same. Uh, there are problem areas which may also lead for unsuccessful completion of some of these. Uh, there is a lot of feedback which the government is taking on this. I mean, I... I, I I just don't blame them because the first step is always to put a policy in place, to put measures in place. And the first layers of feedbacks are now coming. I think there will be a lot of course correction. So is the industry ready to take on programs like what is happening at a DARPA or a DSTL in the UK or what the Chinese are doing? Uh, I'll not say that in all aspects, in all frontier. Uh, the frontier tech is still open. Uh, do we have research integrated environment with academia, industry, and the military, like in the US, which they have, we are still, you know, all struggling as part of this. And one major problem is that we in India are a process-driven and not goal-driven. The day we kind of change this aspect, I think we will hit the nail on the top, on its head. Uh, second, and last part before I just say uh, 
and this part of the question is that the industry needs to walk the talk. Uh, when the government comes out with policies, they're coming out with ease of business, they're giving you a lot of dole, they're creating these processes. IDEX makes an uh, industry player like me, which is a startup MS, wanting to be an MSME, work directly with the end user. There is just no process. So they are trying to you know, get this little thing out of the way. The industry has to revert back. Industry has to give a thorough completion to anything what they you know, claim that they're doing. This puts a lot of pressure on the industry. You will have to go through a lot of technology innovations, getting the right manpower. Manpower is a big issue. You know, you, you, you will understand these are frontier tech. And last but not the least, the funding. The government can only support you with a certain funding level. You have to go out uh, like don't seeking out those uh, foraging for that uh, critical funding. So I think the industry also needs to walk the talk, support the government. But I'm very, very positive, very gungo about it, Manu. This is the right cusp we are at. One, the technology innovations are here. Second, the warfare is changing to take those innovations. There is a need. The, there is going to be an ask from the end user. And last but not the least, the government is putting in place beautiful policies which can support players like us coming with innovative ideas, you know, supporting disruption, innovation. And closing this loop is where this whole little pot of gold is. Sami, thank you so much. Very interesting talk and wishing you the best. We need many more innovators uh, like you. Uh, you know, with your background and I hope that happens. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you guys.